Well, good morning. It is so great to see all of you here this morning on, believe it or not, the first day of spring, right? Can you, I know, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? But uh, today is also Palm Sunday, and so as we gather for worship today, we'll be celebrating and reflecting upon Jesus' entry into uh, Jerusalem as um, they prepared and as we prepared for Holy Week this week. Um, if you are a guest with us today, we really are glad that you're here, and we just ask one thing of you this morning. If you would fill out a Connect card, um, hopefully there's one of those on a pew somewhere in front of you there. If you'd fill one of those out, we'll take an opportunity this week to follow up with you and just let you know that we are glad that you're with us this morning and uh, just share a little bit of information uh, with you about us. So this morning, we'd like to begin our time of worship by reading responsibly the call to worship that is printed in our bulletin. So I invite you to turn there and follow along with me as we read responsibly. Awake to the day of triumph for our Savior. Come with your hosannas and songs. Fill the air with welcome to the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you guys doing? Can you turn around so I can see your faces? So you can listen? Next week, we celebrate Easter. And today is a special day, too. Today is what we call Palm Sunday. Can you say that with me? Palm Sunday. And we represent and we speak about when they brought palm leaves. And they celebrated Jesus, who was the king of the Jews. Do you ever remember singing songs 
about Jesus being king, or if you don't remember them yet, you'll remember them as you get older. And I want to read a verse for you this morning. And do you remember when Jesus was born? The wise men or the magi came to visit them, and they went and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. Thank you, Mr. Adam. Perfect timing. So what does this remind you of? This reminds you of a king, a crown that a normal king might wear. Kings do things like make sure people get along, and they control the government. But Jesus was a different kind of king. Jesus cared about everyone. He cared about people getting along and people being peaceful. And Jesus wore this kind of crown. What's this a crown of? Do you know? Thorns. Jesus wore a different kind of crown. And Jesus was a different kind of king. So as you grow up and you sing songs about Jesus, think about how he was different from most leaders. He was a leader that cared about everyone, and he wanted everybody to know God. And that was the kind of king he was. And this was his crown. So can you guys pray and thank Jesus for being our king? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love, and thank you for being a great king who helps us love others and love God. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning is um, one that is appropriate for this Palm Sunday, one that we, most of us, are probably very familiar with. It is Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. I invite you to listen in as we read together this story of Jesus entering into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. After telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, Why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, The Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all of the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And Jesus replied, If they kept quiet, even the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, as we are gathered here this morning on Palm Sunday, we have been reminded of the story 
of Jesus entering into Jerusalem. We have been reminded of the cheerfulness that the crowd shared as they celebrated the coming of the King. And Lord, as we gather this morning, we are here to worship you, our King. Lord, this world is filled with many kings who make many claims about their power, their authority. But you are the king of all kings. Father, as we gather this morning for worship, we pray that your word and the words that we share as we sing and as we listen to the message might inspire us and challenge us to walk in your footsteps. Father, Easter is coming, but it's not here yet. And there's a lot that's going to happen between now and then. Our faith may be tested, as was those who followed you then. Lord, may we be found faithful. And Father, as we gather for worship this morning, on the first day of spring, we remember those who in our church family or even in our own families or friends that we know from work or wherever, who just especially need your presence in their lives today. And Lord, we know that you know them and that you know their situations far more than we do but yet we lift them up to you in prayer because we love and care about them. God, as we continue in worship this morning, open our hearts, open our minds to your spirit. It's through Jesus Christ, our King, that we pray. Amen.
Dear Father, we ask that you accept these gifts that we bring to you this morning. We just pray that during this Easter season that the magnitude of the gift of grace that you gave to us through the sacrifice of your Son will impress upon us the need for us to give freely of our time and our resources. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. forsaken me. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Palm Sunday is one of those Sundays where politics and preaching go hand in hand. It certainly was on that Palm Sunday, and I'd say this year it is too. So I'm just going to warn you, this message might just be a little bit different. In fact, it is a little bit different, okay? As we celebrate Palm Sunday today, I would like for us to imagine the scene there in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday as Passover began. I think it's helpful for us to understand 
that Passover was one of the busiest holidays of the year for Jerusalem. Vendors filled the streets, selling all kinds of foods and religious goods. And during that time, the city's population swelled exponentially from about 40,000 people to around 200,000 people. It was a time of religious fervor. And this year, it also happened to be a time of political unrest. Can you relate to that in any way, I wonder? For decades, the Roman Empire had controlled Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish people were counting on a Messiah who would one day come and take back their city and rebuild the Jewish nation. To get an idea of what Passover was like there in Jerusalem, all we really have to do is think about some of the political rallies that we have seen over the past few weeks for any of our presidential candidates. Holding up signs, cheering, maybe even running up on the stage, I don't know. That's probably what it was like then. In the same way that we've seen people holding up campaign signs and cheering on their political candidates, waving palm branches was a symbol of victory and support. And essentially, it would have been the very same thing. It was loud. Like today, I'm sure it was divisive. And the crowds were emotional. That's the type of atmosphere that was in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Now, the scripture focuses on Jesus' procession into Jerusalem. But we know that he wasn't the first person to be thought of as a political figure to enter Jerusalem on that day. The first was Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea who entered the city from the west. And only later that day did Jesus make his way into Jerusalem, entering from the other side of the city. One scholar summarizes the scene this way. Two processions entered Jerusalem on a spring day in the year 30. One was a peasant procession, the other an imperial procession. From the east, Jesus rode in on a donkey, cheered by his followers. Jesus was from the peasant village of Nazareth. His message was about the kingdom of God and his followers came from the peasant class. On the opposite side of the city, from the west, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, entered Jerusalem at the head of a column of imperial cavalry and soldiers. The two processions embody the central conflict of the week that led to Jesus' crucifixion. These two processions are significant Because they set up the scene for us historically and politically and most importantly, theologically. Pilate and Jesus entered Jerusalem representing two very different kingdoms. So let's consider just how they were different. On the one hand, there was Pilate the governor of Judea, who represented the Roman Empire. On the other hand, there was Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, who proclaimed the coming of the kingdom of God. Pilate entered Jerusalem filled with pride and putting his authority on display, riding on a strong stallion. Jesus entered Jerusalem in humility, riding on a meager donkey that had, was never ridden by anyone before. When Pilate came to Jerusalem, he was most likely dressed in a fine royal robe. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he was just wearing the clothes of an everyday peasant. Pilate was preceded and probably succeeded by Roman soldiers dressed in uniforms, riding on large horses, and marching in unison all around him. 
when Jesus entered Jerusalem, it was just him and a few of his disciples. Pilate made a show of his military strength by carrying a sword and surrounding himself with powerful soldiers dressed for battle as a show of power and authority and importance. He wanted everyone to know that he was in charge. One scholar wrote about Pilate's coming into Jerusalem that day. He writes this, Pilate's procession was the visible manifestation of imperial Roman power. Once a year during the Passover, the Roman procurator moved his headquarters to Jerusalem in a show of strength designed to prevent any outbreaks of insurgency or violent rebellion against Roman rule. Jesus, on the other hand, never carried a weapon, and on the day he entered Jer Jerusalem would have been defenseless. As we consider some of the differences between Jesus and Pilate, what we see is a clear juxtaposition of power and purpose between two kingdoms. It's so clear that this story invites us to choose between the two processionals. On that day as Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he was proclaimed by many to be a king. But less than a week later, the same crowd who waved palm branches and cheered him on would turn their back on him as they yelled, crucify him, crucify him. Was Jesus really a king? Pilate would later ask. Yes, but what we see is that Jesus was a different kind of of king. So let's consider what kind of different king Jesus was. I'll share a few of my thoughts with you. As a different kind of king, Jesus ruled by love rather than by fear. In John 13, 35, he stated this so clearly when he said, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. As a different kind of king, Jesus lived by peace and not by violence. When Judas led the soldiers to Jesus on that night that he was betrayed, and Jesus went up to Jesus and he hugged him and he kissed him and then the soldiers the Roman guards began to move in and things began to escalate a little bit and maybe things got a little bit rowdy because P Peter pulled out his knife and he took a swing at one of the guards and he cut off his ear and the last words that Jesus said to his disciples before he was taken away in response to Peter's act of violence was this no more of this, no more of this. As a different kind of king, Jesus chose mercy over might. In his last speech as a vice president, Herbert Humphrey said this, <clears throat> the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. I encourage you to research and determine for yourself if we are a country who are focused more on mercy than we are on might or military power. Jesus was a different kind of king. As a different kind of king, Jesus came to be the sacrifice for all people rather than to make a sacrifice of others. Statecraft has always required its sacrifice, the sacrifice of its children 
in order to keep going. It did under Pilate, and it still does today, and I think this is probably one of the most difficult differences about the kingship of Jesus that we may have to wrestle with. As a different kind of king, Jesus chose suffering over survival and success. He even suffered to the point of death. I think it's hard for us today to find any good purposes for suffering in our lives. We're so geared towards cure and wellness, being healed and things going well. But one theologian I read shared this thought. The world does not see suffering as a meaningful part of life, but only as an interruption. With that understanding, there are only two things to do when pain and suffering occur. The first is to manage and lessen the pain. The second is to look for the cause of the pain and eliminate it. But in God's kingdom, breaking in even today, even right now, suffering can be a means for growth and understanding and a place of deep, abiding love and even peace. Jesus was a different kind of king. As a different kind of king, Jesus lived under God's authority instead of wielding his authority over others. When he was tempted by Satan after he was baptized, Satan offered Jesus all of the authority that the world had to offer. But Jesus turned it down in order to live under the authority of God the Father. And this was probably one of the first clues that Jesus was a different kind of king and that God's kingdom is a different kind of kingdom. As a different kind of king, Jesus said that he came to serve rather than to be served. Or to say it differently, Jesus came to serve rather than to make servants of other people. As a different kind of king, Jesus came not only for the purpose of bringing one nation under God, but to bring all the nations that exist under the lordship and kingship of Jesus Christ. We read about this in John's vision in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb of God. Lastly, as a different kind of king, Jesus never made promises that he couldn't keep, but rather he himself was the fulfillment of God's promise of a king in Scripture. When we think about the kingship of Jesus this way, perhaps we can see why just a few days later the crowd wanted to crucify Jesus. He was a different kind of of king and he was not the kind of king they wanted so to close I would like to invite us to consider this if we had been in Jerusalem on that day and had seen both processions passing by I wonder which one would have attracted our attention the most Which one do you think you would have chosen to follow? Two processions, two theologies, two kingdoms, two choices. Which one would we have chosen? Which one are we choosing today? What kind of king do we expect Jesus 
to be. Palm Sunday reminds us that God did not send Jesus into the world to meet our expectations. But rather God sent Jesus into the world to change our expectations. The story of Palm Sunday forces us to ask ourselves whether or not Jesus is really the kind of king we want in our lives. Are we willing to call Jesus our king knowing that he is a different kind of king and knowing that his kingdom is different from what we may expect or hope for? Or like those who rallied for him on Palm Sunday, do we turn away when he doesn't meet our expectations? As we prepare to enter into Holy Week this week, I think that's the question we all have to answer for ourselves. So let us pray. Father, it's so easy to worship Jesus when he is victorious and loving. It's much more difficult to worship him when we see him riding on a donkey, when he calls us to humility, to peace, and even death. Yet he is the one we want to worship. We want to turn away from our pride and worship the only one who didn't need to be humble and yet chose humility anyway. Lord, we turn away from our anger, our desire to go to battle, and we worship the king who comes in peace. Your ways are so different from our ways. You don't always go to battle on the issues that are important to us yet we trust you to deal with injustice in your time and in your way. And Lord, we thank you that you come in peace. We turn away from our desire to hold on to our lives and worship a different King of Kings who comes to die and who invites us to die ourselves as well. Although we cling so tightly to our lives, we believe Jesus when he says that those who find their lives will lose it. But those who lose their lives for his sake will find true life. Lord, we believe that. And we worship Jesus, the humble, the peaceful, even the dying king in whose name we pray. Amen. Today we cheer for Jesus. But there's a lot of time between now and Easter. Why don't we stand and sing our final hymn together? Would you please stand? <laughs>
As we prepare to leave this morning, a few reminders that I would like to share with you. First of all, um, on Friday, we'll have a Good Friday service right here. So we invite all of you to come back for that on Friday night at 7 o'clock as we prepare for worship on Easter Sunday. And uh, just remind you as well that that is a great time to invite a friend, a neighbor, a family member, whoever, uh, to come to worship that day. Um, If you are a parent or a child or a grandparent, uh, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt here on Saturday, and it's not going to rain. It's not going to rain, I'm telling you. So, so uh, with that, um, reach out to somebody you know and invite them to come and bring their children to that. Um, and then the last thing, just for our members, just a reminder that we will have a memorial service uh, right here at 2 o'clock today for uh, Mrs. Doris Dudley and her family. So invite you to come back as well for that. Uh, would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, for this time to be together and to worship you, we give you thanks. Father, for Palm Sunday, for what it meant and what it means today, we give you thanks. And Lord, as we have gathered here and worship you in a spirit of truth and love, we pray that we might leave here with that same spirit in our hearts for all the world to see. It's through Christ we pray. Amen. recently shared a quote he said the church has left the building (laughs) and I thought that was great because think about it the church the church is not the building we all know that you know this is this is not the church we're the church and you know we have Sunday school we have Wednesday night programs we have prayer groups who meet all of these things are great and discipleship can absolutely happen in these things but what would happen if the church left the building I'm Whitney Goulding and I coordinate a play group on Thursday mornings. Right now there are five moms with their babies. My name is Billy Freeman and I lead a small group Bible study on Tuesday evenings. People come and they get involved in English class. It's sort of the open door. You know, it's a very innocuous way that people can get connected and not feel like they're going to church or making necessarily a step in a spiritual direction. Uh, So they're involved in classes maybe on Sunday or on Wednesday, but sometimes folks want to have more of a study than that. And they'll come to me or they'll come to some of our teachers. At present, I'm teaching four individuals on Skype and on the telephone. All of them were my students here at Forest Hills in our ESL Bible classes. I would say the best thing is just really Christian support from other moms. That a lot of times being a mom, staying at home all day can feel really isolating. We've all have been through or are going through big life changes and to have 
those really close-knit relationships now that have formed over the last several months. That's just been really life-changing to have women who are that close and, and who really care about me and my child. Over the last about year and a half, I've met with uh, several different individuals, uh, some from China, some from Japan, uh, some from other places as well, to study uh, the Bible and learn more about God's Word and day-to-day -day application. I've been studying for four years with Amy. She uh, was here four years ago, and she made her profession of faith and was baptized while she was here. And when she went back to China, she wanted to continue studying with me. Her husband, who is not a believer, had been watching her and listening to her study with me on Skype. And he became interested in studying the Bible through listening to us. And now, Amy is studying with her husband. Small groups can, can benefit the church as a whole just because people are getting into relationships, deeper relationships with each other within the church. You know, it's kind of self-sustaining. They're taking care of each other. Meeting at home, I think, provides um, an openness that people maybe don't feel in a larger setting. It really isn't about what program or event or whatever it may be at church, but it really is about doing life together and making those connections with other people, whether it's through Sunday school or through small groups that meet in homes or it could even be a, a breakfast group that just meets um, once a week. But I really think uh, discipleship is, um, is really going to be impactful when we get back to and really prioritize the relationship aspect of, of what it's about.